What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. You know who it is. It's your boy Nicholas representing the one and only Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. I know you see this beautiful thing hanging on my shoulder right here. Today's a special day, not only because we're doing first round mock draft for 2018. What we're doing today is we're gonna do a couple giveaways. The giveaways are gonna be this. Listen to me and listen to me carefully. Fantasy Jocks, as some of you may or may not know, uh, they're a company that I've been working with for a long time. Fantasy Jocks makes these belts. These are incredible. These are like legitimately, if you follow WWF, these are the same quality as the WWF. They are very, they're good. What Fantasy Jocks did is they produced a a mini version of this it's like a 13 or 14 inch version of this it's like a mini belt still the same quality and I have them sending me one or two of them I'm gonna give away one to you guys that you could use for your fantasy football league you don't have to pay for it I'm gonna pay for shipping and ship it out to you guys this is the one we use for the e-town get down draft I still haven't given it to Shane who won congrats to Shane rookie taking the belt we're gonna leave that there for now the second giveaway is gonna be another one of my hats I only have a few of these left I have the pink version and the baby blue version I'm gonna be giving away a mini belt I'm gonna be giving away one of my hats this is how you enter i started an instagram for fantasy football related purposes only you're gonna have to go follow that bdge underscore and then fantasy football one word go follow me on the gram i'm posting like five to seven times a week only valuable information you'll get something valuable out of me every single day that's fantasy football related so you got to go give me a follow if you want to be entered into the giveaway and i want you to go comment on you can comment on any of the posts i've put out so far you can comment on yesterday's today's whatever it might be whenever you see this you comment whatever you want on that post you can go comment titties but i want you to end it with a hashtag bdge that is all i'm asking for follow me on the new instagram comment and do hashtag bdge and you'll automatically be entered into the giveaway for one of these two and i'll pick two of them at random i don't care what your comment is and now let's get into the mock draft so play that funky music white boy All right, let's dive into the muck, right into the grit, get into them numbers and whatnot. So this mock draft is gonna be 10 teams, first 10 picks, 2018, half PPR, four points passing touchdown, six points receiving, rushing touchdown, half point PPR. And here's the ADP, and this is as of like mid-January when I was starting this blog post, so some things might have changed, and this is PPR according to Fantasy Football Calculator. So, now these are not paid drafts. If you wanna do paid drafts, I highly suggest the app Play Draft, where you can get into actual drafts now and do best ball leagues. If you sign up, you using promo code BDGE. You'll get a free entry into a real money draft, but that's neither here nor there. I'm done with the promos. And my number one overall pick, uh, this probably won't come as a surprise to a lot of you guys, which will be Le'Veon ringing the bell for the Steelers. Uh, he was the same guy I kind of argued for picking him over David Johnson last year. And I mean, I didn't win that, but David Johnson got hurt. So you obviously are happy with Le'Veon Bell there. Now, he's currently going number two overall as a running back two behind only Todd Gurley. I will take him ahead of Todd Gurley next year. He's my man's right here. He was RB2 on the year, only behind Gurley in 2017. 406 touches he had last year, which was over 27 a game. And this is despite the slow start he got off to. I don't remember if a lot of you guys remember he held out. He didn't go to training camp, and then he was all of a sudden he just kind of said, oh, I'm ready to play. First couple games started off really slow and did not play well. In per game numbers, he was back. He had the most attempts per game. He had the second most rushing yards per game, third in rushing touchdowns per game, first in targets, first in receptions, third in receiving yards. And that receiving point of view, this is something I'm going to touch on a lot throughout the offseason is getting involved more pass catching backs on your team. And this is something my next article is going to be five crazy statistics from the 2017 fantasy football season. It's going to be my next video as well. And a lot, of, not a lot of it, but there are definitely some points I'm making with pass catching running backs. And that's the reason why Le'Veon Bell is going to be my number one guy, right? He only played in 15 games, but despite that, he led all NFL running backs in carries with 321 and receptions with 85. Had he played in 16 games, he would have hit that 2000 total yard mark. We have Big Ben coming back next year. He said he's not going to retire. He has, again, one of the top offensive lines that he's running behind. Per Football Outsiders, they were seventh in run blocking, number one in pass blocking. No reason not to love his situation again here. He'll have Antonio Brown on, on the outside. He'll have uh, upcoming Juju Smith-Schuster. And he'll have Martavis Bryant as their wide receiver three, hopefully, if he's back with Pittsburgh again next year. There's not a lot of teams that could have a guy like Martavis Bryant as their wide receiver three to spread the field out again. So nothing much changes for Bell. And uh, 
20 over 27 touches a game coming off the heels of a 2016 campaign where he averaged over 28 touches a game in the 12 game span so you can see that no running back is going to touch the ball as much as he is and a lot of those touches come from way of pass catching so bell is my number one guy number two we're going todd Gurley here i'm definitely not mad if you want to take Gurley as the number one guy he is uh the number one overall adp according to fantasy football calculator right now I'm going to stick him at number two. And you can see by this tweet here I sent out, if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you're going to follow me on Twitter, at Nick underscore BDGE. I asked you guys, my followers, first overall pick in 2018, half PPR, who are you taking? 45% of you went Gurley, 33% Le'Veon, 14 Zeke or A. Brown, 8 David Johnson. So uh, it's interesting to see that. So a lot, you know, the ADPs of FFC say Gurley. You guys, my followers, are saying Gurley. I want to hear, comment down below why you're taking Gurley over Le'Veon Bell, if that's your plan. And I get it, right? The up-and-coming offense, they are they have everything going for them. So I can't, it's hard to decipher basically one versus the other right now, but I just want Bell because I'm more comfortable with him. Here's some of the numbers I've bro broken down for Gurley, right? He, I mean, he single-handedly won you championships last year. Per NFL.com, he was the most frequently owned player on fantasy championship teams in 2017 at 47%. 0.1%. So 47.1% of teams that won the championship in NFL.com leagues had Gurley. The next highest guy was Le'Veon with 27%. Kareem Hunt third at 20.2. I don't know how accurate that is, to be honest with you. Per ESPN.com, Kamara was the highest owned player on teams that made the championship, but not won the championship. So Gurley probably won you the championship. Either way, Gurley, 2017. He won it. He took the dub. There ain't no arguing there. 2,093 total yards. The knocks that came into the season are gone. The touchdowns I was I was nervous about. I was I was nervous about his uh, involvement in the receiving game. I was nervous about that offense as a whole. I was nervous about the offensive line. What this kind of taught me is that offseason changes, such as free agency pickups, you know, Whitworth on the line, Sean McVay, number one, obviously, and the progression of a quarterback like Jared Goff are things that you really, really, really need to take into consideration when you're evaluating a running back for fantasy purposes. Early, going into the situation last year, you can't, you couldn't have said that you liked his situation. The only arguments for him were that he's going to have the volume and they can't be any worse than they were the year prior. So to me, that was like a red flag. Like he could end up still averaging 3.5 yards per carry. Something like, uh, you know, like Lamar Miller, right? The volume's going to be there. He can't get any worse, but he still can have a shitty year by all standards. So that was my thing with Gurley, but... Clearly, that was not not what happened. He was second in the NFL in receiving yards, first in receiving touchdowns for all running backs. If you wiped out all of Todd Gurley's rushing numbers, take away all of his running numbers last year, zero rushing yards, zero rushing touchdowns, he would have finished as wide receiver 25 in PPR league still. That's wild, fam. That's out of control. Wide receiver 25. So you're literally getting... Uh, an elite RB1 based off his rushing numbers, plus a borderline wide receiver two, wide receiver three in PPR leagues with Gurley in one roster spot. Career highs in everything across the board. There's no reason to think that the way this offense is going and the way the team is going that he won't be able to replicate these kind of numbers again. Offense is going to be real good. They led the NFL in points per game, which was a 180 turnaround after literally being last place in scoring in 2016. They had the third best run blocking line this year per Football Outsiders, which is probably the biggest shock to me about how they were so bad last year. Signed Whitworth and now they're top three. So that's what he has heading into this season. There's really no more point to talking about Bell versus Gurley, but I want to know why you're taking Gurley over Bell if you are. Number three, Antonio Brown. Right now going off the board, number four overall per football, fantasy football calculator. I have missed three, still the first wide receiver off the board. Finished as wide receiver two in 2017. Arguably should have been the NFL MVP this year if he did not get hurt after 14 games. It was the fourth straight year of Brown being the number one fantasy wide receiver on a points per game basis. Sheesh. He was on pace for 115 catches, 1,752 receiving yards, 10 touchdowns, fifth straight year of 105 plus catches, 1,285 plus yards, and eight plus touchdowns. And he's usually on the much higher end of those numbers. But that's, that's the minimum over the last five years. We're witnessing greatness, people. We are witnessing greatness. Antonio Brown, we're going to look back and be like, Zam, Antonio Brown was the GOAT. I didn't get to watch Jerry Rice. I was a little too young for that. 
but I can't imagine with the way Antonio Brown is playing that he's not going to end up as the GOAT. He's the most consistent player in the NFL and fantasy football over the last five years in terms of production. That includes any running back, any wide receiver, any quarterback, whatever it is. Honestly, I wouldn't be mad if you took him number one overall because he is the foundation of your fantasy football team. He's going to put you up 18 points uh, fantasy points PPR per game. I know the upside is much higher with guys like Gurley or Bell, but Brown, <coughs> you're not. You're definitely not losing your league with Brown, and you're probably going to have a good chance of winning it with Brown. So if you wanted to take him number one overall, I said the same exact thing last year too. I wanted him ahead of Zeke. I wanted him ahead of a few guys that people uh, people were kind of arguing against the fact. But Brown, you know, you're not going wrong if you have Brown in your lineup, no matter where you take him in the draft. Don't let like one or two little ADP changes dictate how you draft. Like I said, Big Ben's going to be back, and I think the emergence of Juju definitely helps Brown and gets some of the attention off of him because he's always commanding double and triple teams. Not that he can't beat him because he can. I was taking a look at some of the numbers. There was three games this season when Antonio Brown and Juju Smith-Schuster were not on the field together. When Brown played and Juju did not play. And I looked at the numbers. You could see that without Juju, he played a lot better. But that's only, I mean, look at the numbers. 33.5 points per game. Like, it's only because it was non-human. But you look at the numbers with Juju, he's still averaging 19 PPR fantasy points a game. So I think like you're getting the best of it. He's awesome with Juju. He's amazing without Juju. Like it doesn't really matter. I don't think that's going to have an effect on him. And I think that's just going to help open the field more. 188 receiving yards a game for Brown without Juju, but that's neither here nor there. So we have Bell, Gurley, Antonio Brown. Number four, the forgotten David Johnson. Currently going off the board at number three, actually running back three. I have him ranked number four running back three. It's very hard to argue against David Johnson as a top three pick or even the number one pick overall. Obviously, this is a lot of recency bias due to the fact that he was injured all last year, right? With that little wrist bang up, bang up. The big thing going to be the team. That is the one knock that you have for DJ that you don't have for Le'Veon Bell that you don't have for Todd Girl the Pearl. We know he's going to get 25 touches a game, just like the other two guys are. We know he's explosive. He can hit that home run. He can make a lot of things happen. He could catch the ball. He could run the ball. But the team situation is much worse in Arizona for David Johnson. And that's obviously because Carson Palmer's retiring. They just were not good last year. They were 22nd in yards per game. They were 30th in rushing yards per game. 25th in points per game. Only 18.4. And uh, Football Outsiders had their line ranked as the 17th best run blocking line. With Palmer retiring, you know, we don't know who's going to be the quarterback now. I don't think they have a single quarterback under contract between Palmer, Gabbert, and Drew Stanton. What I've been hearing a lot of rumors about is Nick Foles going. And this is the first time this has actually popped into my head. I didn't write anything about this. Nick Foles going to Arizona would actually be really, really, really interesting for David Johnson. But for right now, we'll say, you know, they have Blaine Gabbert, who they benched for Drew Stanton. Drew Stanton's going to be a free agent. It's not pretty any way you look at it. But it just means that I think it'll it'll be harder for David Johnson to come, uh, come across scoring opportunities if this offense can't really move the ball. I do expect them to um, get a quarterback either through the draft or through free agency. And like they said, I think Nick Foles is the front runner for the Arizona job. And if, if they can get Nick Foles, who is obviously a competent quarterback, Super Bowl winning quarterback at that. Also want to say to the Philadelphia Eagles fans, man, fuck y'all. If Foles comes to Arizona, I mean, I'm still not going to take him above Gurley or Le'Veon, but you're going to feel a lot more comfortable taking him at that number four spot. They have a whole new coaching staff here in Arizona. Steve Wilkes is is taking over as the head coach. He is the former Panthers defensive coordinator. Very defensive minded, of course. Could be a good thing. Could be, you know, transitioning more to a defensive style ground and pound type offense. I know they've really been kind of airing the ball out a lot with Palmer. So that could be a big change. Uh, Mike McCoy takes over as the offensive coordinator. I mean, you know who Mike McCoy is. You heard of him. He's very experienced in the NFL. <clears throat> Doesn't mean he's very good. We'll have to see how things shape up. I'm, I don't think Mike McCoy is a very good offensive coordinator, but he's been around the block. So now the good thing for a guy like David Johnson is like these outside fa factors, new coaches, new quarterback, whatever it is, don't affect him as much as they would another bat. Like say you're analyzing a guy like Lamar Miller or you're analyzing an Isaiah Crowell. Those things are going to take a huge impact on on their fantasy outlook but with a guy like david johnson he's so good and he has that breakaway speed and that home run ability that can give you 12 fantasy points on a single play that they don't affect him as much so david johnson number four i'm fine with that number five another running back ezekiel elliott fourth running back off the board five overall the same adp for fantasy football calculator Last year, he finished as running back nine overall, obviously, because he missed six games due to the suspension. It's a wacky-ass year for Z. He gets to put that behind him, and now he gets to focus solely on the 2018 
season. But when you had Zeke in your lineup this year, despite him playing in only 10 games, he was very, 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 very good. Listen to the stat. He had that one dud game against Denver, right? That happened kind of early in the year where he rushed for, or he gained 22 total yards on 13 touches. So a terrible game. And that was when Denver had that elite run defense in the beginning of the year. Besides that, played in nine other games besides that Denver game. He had at least 115 total yards or a touchdown in all nine other games. That shit's crazy. On a points per game basis, Zeke last year was running back two in standard leagues, running back three in PPR leagues, averaging nearly 27 touches a game. His 16 game pace last year would have been 2,003 total yards, 42 catches, 42, you be doing this shit, and 14 and a half tutties. Despite a bad start to the season and a lot of question marks going into the year, right? They lost a little couple pieces on the O-line. Cowboys line still ranked fourth in run blocking per football outsiders. And again, they have all five starters under contract for 2018. So they will be back. They'll be ready to roll. They'll have a new mindset going into 2018. They'll be looking to shut down the Eagles. We'll see how well that goes. Going into the year, right, the Cowboys are talking about they wanted to get Zeke more involved through the air. And we saw a slight increase. In 2016, he, he averaged 2.1 catches a game. Last year, it went up to 2.6 catches a game. So it was a half a catch per game increase. But the targets were where it took more of a step up. It went from 2.6 targets a game to 3.8. So he's getting 1.2 targets more per game last year than he did in 2016. So that's probably something you could expect going into 2018. He should be more involved in the passing game again. He only had two games all of 2016 that he saw five targets. In 2017, he played, like I said, in just 10 games. He had five targets or more in five separate games. So despite playing less games, he had five targets or more in three more games than he did in 2016. But you still want to see more, more of that, right? You still want to see more out of Zeke in that sense in order for you to put him in the Le'Veon Bells and the Todd Gurley's of the world, you know, who consistently get five, six, seven, eight, sometimes fucking 12 receptions in a game, right? That's not where Zeke is, and I'm, I'm not sure we're ever going to see him get there, which is kind of a travesty considering how athletic and how good he is in the passing game. But Zeke, number five, I'm cool with that. All right, so we halfway through. We five peoples in, five draft picks in. If you're enjoying the video so far, if you feel like you've gotten value from it, please do me a huge favor. Just scroll down a little bit and hit the thumbs up button. That's all I need you to do. That would help me tremendously and I really appreciate that. Put a lot of work and time into these videos. So if you can respect that, appreciate that, please just go give it the thumbs up. And we move on to the back half of the draft. Now we've done a lot of running backs. We've gotten a lot of these backs out of the way. Let's move to wide receiver two. And that is D-Hop. A young boy out of Houston, Atlanta, Vegas. He's my number six. He's my wide receiver too, as he is for the fantasy football calculator ADP. Last year, he finished as wide receiver one in in uh, fantasy football, man. What a year, what a year for D-Hop. Yo, he had that disappointing 2016. He comes back and finishes number one overall. He leads the NFL in targets, finishes with 96 catches, almost 1,400 yards, and 13 touchdowns in 15 games. Those 13 touchdowns led the NFL. The quarterback situation. When you look at the numbers, which I did, here you go, look at the splits. We had this breakout crazy at least like six games from Deshaun Watson, right? The rookie quarterback, then he tore his ACL, and you're like, fact, like D-Hop's about to be D-flop real quick. What do I do with him? He didn't have to do anything with him. As you can see, in split is with Deshaun Watson, a quarterback, out of split is without Deshaun Watson. Now, the numbers, the production are almost identical. It's a little bit better with Deshaun Watson, but didn't really make a difference in terms of his fantasy production, right? So you're like, okay, does it even matter if Deshaun Watson a quarterback? The thing I want to point out is here, besides the one touchdown per game with Deshaun Watson there, is you look at the target numbers. He's getting less targets with Deshaun Watson, almost a target and a half per game less with Watson at quarterback, but his production is even a little bit higher. You see him like half a point per game higher in PPR, half PPR, and that is the big thing is he's getting less volume, but more efficient targets. And that's what you're gonna see with Deshaun Watson at quarterback. So if his volume spikes even more, if he goes from 10.8 targets a game to 12 targets a game, his fantasy production is gonna be through the roof next year with Deshaun Watson, who should be ready to go for, for the 2018 season, right? He tore his ACL in November. He's reportedly already running and is scheduled to be good to go for OTA. So we will have that Watson Hopkins dynamic duo there. D-Hop had his highest yards per reception total or average since 2014, which I like. The looks he was getting, the targets he, getting, he was getting were further downfield. He had the ninth highest average depth of target among all wide receivers with at least 90 targets. 
So there was 33 wide receivers. 33 wide receivers that had at least 90 targets on the year. He had the ninth highest average depth of target. So again, that's Deshaun Watson trusting him. They're giving him more deep balls, uh, which is always a good thing in fantasy. The other part about D-Hop you gotta love is his involvement near the end zone. He had a career high 10 targets inside the opponent's 10 yard line. He caught seven of those for touchdown. So he caught seven of 10 targets inside the 10 for touchdowns. You look back at his previous years, I'm going back to 2014, 2013, right? Here's what we see. In 2016, he had six targets inside the 10, caught one of them for a touchdown. 2015, he had seven targets, caught four of them. 2014, he had four targets, he caught one of them. 2013, he had six targets, he caught one of them. He was way, way, way more involved in the 10-yard line, inside the 10-yard line this year than he had ever been in his previous career, and he's more efficient, more more volume. It was all good for D-Hop. Last thing I want to show you is this little chart, which I had on uh, my IG. So every every day, every day, Wednesday on IG, I'm going to throw out a crate called Wild Stat Wednesdays. And this was my last one uh, that I put out. So make sure you're following me on IG, even if you're not going into the giveaway. So I looked at his, his fantasy finishes each week on a weekly basis, right? Wide receiver one in week one, wide receiver two in week two, whatever. This was his 15 games he played in. He was a top 20 wide receiver in 87% of his games last year. The top 15 and 73, and you could, you know, you could, you could figure out the rest. Y'all are smart. Y'all are mathematically out of the game, right? So basically, consistency. It's not only like he had big games and he was awesome here and awesome there. He was consistent week in and week out, putting you up really, really, really good. Now, eight out of 15 games, he was a top 10 wide receiver. I didn't look at the numbers for Antonio Brown, but I'm guessing that Brown's probably around the same number, but no one else comes close to what this consistency number pulls out. So Watson and Hopkins are going to be a duo for years to come. I'm gr I'm fine with D-Hop in the top five. I'm fine with him in the top seven, eight, whatever you want to do. But he's my wide receiver two off the board. Next up, we have running back out of Jacksonville, Leonard Fournette. Right now, Fantasy Football Calculator's ADP has him 17 overalls, RB11. That's ridiculous. That's going to change very soon. I can guarantee you that. I have him number seven overall, running back five. Last year, he finished as running back eight. Honestly, I'm not sure what I'm more impressed with. The Rams turnaround or the Jacksonville turnaround? Comment below. What are you more impressed with? How the Rams flipped it or the Jacksonville Jaguars did? Because I think it's more impressive kind of how Jacksonville did it because they did it exactly how they play like they put it on paper they said exactly what they were going to do and then they executed right they were like we're going to mask Blake Bortles we're going to invest in our defense heavily right they picked up Clyde Campbell uh Church at safety obviously AJ Bowie at cornerback drafted Ramsey Miles Jack all these guys um improved their offensive line a little bit and then obviously took Leonard Fournette fourth overall and they were a ground and pound team they were a defensive 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 minded team and it's exactly what Tom Coughlin said they were going to be when they came in they did it they dominated the Rams just made the switch and were just bonkers so I mean I guess that's kind of more impressive too but either way it's it's really 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 crazy so let's get back to Fournette and why I love him next year so fourth overall pick in the draft right racked up over 1340 total yards 10 touchdowns on 304 touches that was just in 13 games. That season-long pace would have given him 1650 total yards, 12.3 tutties, and 374 touches, 44 of those being by way of the air. Those are elite RB1 numbers, obviously. You would take that with your top eight pick in a second. That pace, though, you know, when you pace it out, that also means that you got to stay healthy in order for you to get those numbers, which is not something that's Fournette's strong point, right? It was a concern for him coming out of LSU. He, he battled with the lower in, the lower body injuries, the ankle injury especially, and that cost him a few games this year. In 2017, it hampered him a bit throughout the second half of the season. As the adage, the old adage goes for fantasy, if, if he does get hurt or if he misses a couple games, it's not like you're getting a zero in that spot. And I think even if, you know, even if you project him out for 13 or 14 games, the games that you're getting him for, 80% of the season, are RB1 type games. So I would be okay picking him at this place because the volume he gets, right, when he does see the field. The only There's only two players that average more carries per game than Fournette did last year. Fournette's a rookie. Zeke had 24.2. Le'Veon Bell had 21.4 carries per game. Fournette came in at 20.6. So only two running backs saw more carries per game than he did. You look at the way the team is built up, right? They are focused on the ground and pound. They have an elite defense that will win them games. So the volume in terms of him getting the ball on the offensive side of the ball, it's not going anywhere, right? They're saying they might bring Bortles back. Even if, if they don't, it's going to be probably a rookie quarterback or whatever. They're going to lean on Fournette very heavily. There was only two games all season that he didn't touch the ball at least 
20 times. Listen to that. Only two games all season that he didn't touch the ball at least 20 times. He had 15 plus touches in every single game, including their three playoff games. And when it mattered the most, right, their three playoff games, the Jaguars rode the shite out of Fournette. He averaged nearly 26 touches per game in those three playoff games and scored four tutties in those three games. Stay woke, people. Stay woke. Just like Gurley and the Rams, right, scoring opportunities looked to be a major downside for Fournette heading into the season. Wasn't the case. Jacksonville, who ranked 25th in points per game in 2016, flipped the script posted 26 points per game last year, sixth highest in the NFL. Fournette's nine rushing touchdowns were tied for third most in the NFL. Again, he scored four touchdowns in the three playoff games, so that's not even counted on his statistics. But here's the, here's a kicker. When you look at his opportunity near the goal line, right? Tied for fifth most rushes inside the 10 yard line. He had 24 rushes inside opponent's 10 yard line. He had 12 rushes inside the opponent's five yard line. So 12 goal line rushes, which was tied for seventh most in the NFL. Had he played those three extra games, I'm sure he would probably be top three in both of those categories, which is great to see because that's, you know, that was one of the knocks on him coming into the season. So, got to love where Fournette's sitting right now. You got to love his, his combination of ceiling and floor going into 2018, which is why I'll gladly take him with my first round pick. And number eight, this is going to be a good one for y'all. Y'all are going to like this one. I'm going to leave this meme up. I want to see if y'all could figure out who I'm talking about. It's Odell Beckham Jr. My number eight pick, wide receiver three. Any football calculator has him at number 10 overall. Played in just four games last year. Was the wide receiver three in P, uh, on points per game basis. And uh, that just goes to show you that, you know, when he's in the lineup, he's going to be a savage, which is what he's always been. That meme perfectly describes how I feel. He was my first round pick in the E-Town Get Down League. He was the first round pick in my subscriber league. Didn't work out well, but I'll gladly just to pull me back in, baby. Name that show. Like a hot ex-girlfriend, like I'll gladly, he's so pretty, so good looking in terms of fantasy, I'll gladly let him back into my life. Just to smash, just to smash that submit button to put him in my lineup, of course. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it sick and twisted. I'm taking these bad boys off. Just to let him break my heart again. I'll let him do it. I don't care. That's how high his ceiling is, right? He missed week one and he did his best like Dwayne Bowen impression in week two. Before we knew it, he cracked his ankle. He's out for the year. Regardless, the man is from another planet. When you look what he's done over the first 47 games of his career, right? That's how many games he's played in thus far. No player has come close to doing what he's done in those 47 games. These are his averages. 10.5 targets, 6.7 receptions, 94.1 receiving yards, 0.81 touchdowns. He's averaging almost 100 receiving yards and almost a touchdown a game in his first 47 games of his career. Do y'all understand that? That literally means he's giving you 16 PPR fantasy points per game. Anytime the man steps on the field. And we're not, you know, like, he has that blow-up potential where he'll take a slant from fucking the opposite 20 to the end zone. There's not a lot of NFL players that could do that either. Besides so OBJ, he has that explosive power. And I don't think we've seen the big breakout from OBJ yet. I think if he if he gets a fully healthy 2018 season, like, we're going to see some historic monster numbers out of this kid. But there definitely are a few question marks. I, I, I thought of three big question marks heading into next season. That is the quarterback play, his contract situation, and of course his ankle. I think the quarterback situation, as well as the play, is, is the biggest question mark when it comes to OBJ's outlook, right? Last year, we saw the circus that was the New York Giants quarterback position. It was out of control. It was just ridiculous. Anyways, they cleaned house, the coaching staff, they got a new uh, head coach in there, and Eli Manning is expected to be the starter for 2018. That would be my guess at the moment. They sit with the number two overall pick in the draft. Are they going to take a quarterback there? Who knows? If they're going to take a quarterback in this draft, I don't know if it's going to be with the number two pick, but I think they'll take the quarterback, groom him under Eli for at least one year while Eli is still the starter and the quarterback for the Giants. So I would be happy with that if I'm an OBJ owner. I'd rather have Eli in there as a quarterback than this new rookie quarterback because they already have chemistry. Obviously, their timing is down pretty much. That's what I think of the quarterback situation. We'll have to see how it progresses, though. Next, the ankle. It happened in week five. Uh, he's expected to make a full recovery and be ready to roll, so I'm not really worried about that unless some weird conflicting reports happen to come out before the draft. As of right now, I don't, I've don't. i seen him on IG. I see all these videos on Instagram floating around him doing you know the quick steps drill and whatnot. He looks good. He looks fine. So we'll see. He should be good to go for OTAs and whatnot. Um, now the contract. He's on a team option. It basically means for you, for you guys that are not really sure how the contract works, like team option, player option, what that means is 
Usually when they sign a rookie, they'll get like a five-year deal or a four-year deal with a, a team option for the fifth year. What that means is in the fifth year, like going into the fifth year like OBJ is, the team has the choice whether or not they want to pick up that year's contract. They could be like, hey, you know what? We're going to let him walk into free agency. It's the team's option. Player option would obviously be the vice versa, right? Four years and then on the fifth year, OBJ can figure out whether or not he wants to take that option. They have a team option. If they choose the team option, it'll they'll have to pay him $8.1 million next year. He wants a long-term contract, obviously. The Giants should give it to him. I don't know, like, why, why would you not give it to him? He's a once-in-a-generation type of player at the wide receiver position. And you, you can't just let a, a guy with that kind of talent walk. He's super young. I know the immaturity is there, but, like, just shut your mouth and sign the, sign the guy. So I, he's going to be a giant next year either way. I'm not worried about that. So I'm fine taking him as a top-10 pick again. Here's where things get interesting. At the number nine pick, you know, there's a lot of guys you could have went with here, and I'll probably get a, a semi amount of disagreement on this bad boy. I'm going to Alvin Kamara, running back out of New Orleans. And I know initially you're going to be like, holy shit, you're taking him in the top 10 as a first round pick. Hear me out on these numbers though. Hear me out on everything I'm going to say here. Right now, according to Fantasy Football Calculator, he's actually going eight overall. And I have him at nine, running back six. Finished last year as running back three. I was surprised to see Kamara rank this high. I've seen fantasy some fan, fan lists, if you want to say fantasy analysts, rank him as high as running back three on their board. I'm groovy right here with him at number nine. I'm cool with him right here. If you're unfamiliar with Alvin Kamara, one, you probably got some general humane issues, like you ain't never leave your house or own a TV. Two, here's what you want to do. You want to watch the highlight clip that I'm going to put in the description below, or if you're reading this via blog post, guys, I put these all in my blog post. If you want to go over to my site, bdgeat.com, and check it out there, that'll also be linked down below. Make sure you're subscribed to the newsletter too, uh, so I can shoot you out emails whenever something new drops or you know, there's like member content that drops that you guys aren't going to see on YouTube or whatever. So go check out his highlight film and you'll be like, holy shit, no wonder he's a top 10 pick next year in fantasy drafts. Kamara puts together one of the single greatest rookie seasons. Oh, of all time. OAT. Not the GOAT, but oh. 1,554 total yards, 13 touchdowns, 82 receptions, just over 200 touches. That is wildly efficient. There's two arguments that I see people making against Kamara as to why they wouldn't pick him this high. Ingram is still there, number one. Number two, his efficiency was off the chart and it has nowhere to go but down. Two good points, two good points. Obviously, I'd agree with me because I made it. Ingram, right, you're right, Ingram is still there. He isn't going anywhere as far as I'm concerned. But where the fuck was he when Kamara did all this last year? Oh, that's right. He was right there. He didn't go anywhere. Ingram ate too. Kamara ate. They all ate. And that's what I'm saying right here is you don't have to worry about Ingram. We're living in a day and age in fantasy where you don't need to be the feature back to put up monster numbers, right? The same thing happened with Devonta Freeman. Same thing happened with Tevin Coleman. Like all these guys that when you have a counterpart to them can still produce fine fantasy numbers, which leads me to my next point, efficiency. Now I see Kamara as a rich man's Tevin Coleman, basically on a production level. Think about it, right? Heading into last season, everyone was like, no way both guys can eat. Coleman's going to be a huge disappointment. His efficiency was way too high for her to keep it up. Yak, 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 yak. Now, while his numbers did dip a little bit compared to what they were 2016 season, he still finished firmly as an RB2, right? Right where he was in 2016, 2017, RB2 again. And you got to remember, the Saints started last year with Adrian Peterson on the roster. We didn't know how this backfield was going to work out. Kamara started the season averaging 6.6 .6 touches per game and 45 yards per game over their first three games and still finished as RB3. But in 2018, you can expect Kamara to get a full workload right out of the gate, which is even more upside. He didn't have a single game with more than 12 carries last year. Didn't have a single game with more than 12 carries. That is incredible. You can argue his efficiency might decrease, but that volume has nowhere to go but up. And he was already the third most targeted running back in the NFL. 101 targets on the year last year. His rushing numbers can only go up. And you look at where this offense is going. I want you to I want you to look at this stat and look at it closely. This offense has has completely shifted over from a pass first team to a run first offense or a running back use, using offense, I guess, if you want to say. It's a combination of Drew Brees getting older. It's a combination of an improving defense. Whatever it is, this is going to be the norm for the Saints moving forward, at least in the near future. Look at the rushing touchdowns, rushing attempts, and the passing touchdowns and passing attempts. They all decreased like 
tenfold last year or increase in terms of rushing. You could just see the focus of the offense shifting major. Look at the pass attempts for Drew Brees. Knocked down from 674 to 536. They realize they have a very, very, very small window right now with Breeze to make a championship run. And the way they do that is to elongate his career, make sure he takes as few hits as possible at the quarterback position while improving their defense, right? And you look at, this is a crazy stat too, Breeze's pass attempts, right? They fell off from 674 in 2016 to 536. And of those 536 attempts, 172 of them went to either Ingram or Kamara which is 32% of his pass attempts. So it dipped tremendously, and a huge portion of those targets are now going to the running back position. Both guys can and should eat in this backfield. I like Kamora more for his, one, his upside, especially in the volume, right? We've seen how explosive he could be, but his volume upside is huge. Ingram has a little bit of a fumble history, as well as, you know, he's missed some some seasons with, uh, not seasons, but games and seasons with injuries. Kamara's receiving ability, that is such an underrated, portion of analysis this summer I bet is going to be on Kamara you really really have to focus on the fact that receiving from the running back position is such a big part of our game nowadays so yeah his volume his volume ceiling is very intriguing to me as well as his involvement in the passing game so that's just a few things about Kamara and their offensive line per football outsiders and per pro football focus again is one of the best in the league from a run blocking standpoint so I think everything kind of adds up to Kamara having another monster season in his sophomore year. So I'm cool with him again as my first round pick. And the last of the first round picks, number 10, LaShawn McCoy out of Buffalo, man. Never change, Bills Mafia. Never change. I love y'all. This is for you. Right now, his ADP is 15, uh, running back 10. My rank has him 10, running back 7. Finished last year as running back 7 in fantasy. And I... Once I finished this article, I was like, eh, I think I'm going to fall a little bit back on McCoy as the summer goes by. I think there's a few things probably working against him. But for right now, I like him as my number 10 pick. I want you to look at some of these numbers. I want you to check this out. LaShawn McCoy's rookie season in 2009, 2009, if that's how you say it, it was the only year of his entire career, 2009, that he averaged less than 92 total yards per game. So outside of his rookie season, you're basically saying that he's going to give you 100 total yards every single game that he steps on the field. That's it. He's been at that number every single season since. If that ain't triple OG, double OG status. If that doesn't earn him a spot in the first round next year, I don't know what does. Shady, you know, despite doing his best Julio Jones impression and wobbling off the field every game with some kind of ankle issue, he played in all 16 games. That is 31 out of a possible 32 over the last two years. So the durability is there, even though he's getting a little old now. He's, uh, I think he's, what is he, 30, 31? Let me check this out right quick. I didn't even get it. He's 29. He will be 30 in July. So he'll be 30 entering next year. It's not like always the death kill. But what I will say, you know, he had a career low in yards per carry, 4.0. He caught 59 passes, which was his highest total since 2010, his sophomore season. He was basically the entire offense for the Buffalo Bills because that quarterback situation was just a travesty. You know, between the quarterbacks and, and all the offensive trades that went on in the offseason, Shady was basically the only constant for the Bills. So why do I put him behind Kamara or any of these other backs ahead of him? Well, for one, I think the age and the injury bug are kind of due to catch up to him eventually. I don't think that's good analysis on my part, but... I think the combination of the two is a pretty decent chance that one of the two hits him. I would forecast a few games being missed uh, by Shady this year. He's just too much wear and tear on the tires. Their quarterback situation is a disaster right now, uh, so they're going to continue to ride McCoy into the ground. The other thing is his consistency on a week-to-week -week basis. He finished with 50 or fewer rushing yards in 7 of 16 games last year. So almost half the games he had 50 or fewer rushing yards. So obviously that's, you know, a lot of it, the makeup of his yards came from way of receiving yards and receptions, which is fine, but you want to still have that constant knowing that even if, you know, if something doesn't happen in the, in the passing game, he could still get it done on the ground, which wasn't the case last year. His touchdown total, total dipped from 13 to 6 last year, which I think spoke more to the offense than to him as a player, right? What, what was the strength of the Bills in 2016, their offensive line, they were number one I remember the stat uh, in terms of yards before contact, right? Like in terms of it, when a running back got the rock, he had like over three yards before he even got contacted in 2016. Last year, that number dipped pretty dramatically. Their offensive line fell back. 
They were ranked 27th in run blocking per football outsiders last year. So their offensive line play was a lot worse. That's a worry for McCoy because the volume can be there. But if his efficiency numbers are going to keep dipping, he's getting older, and uh, you never know with the injuries. Like, that's just, I don't know. There's a lot of question marks for me in my mind. And it's it's pretty clear that the Bills do not think they're going to win with Tyrod Taylor at quarterback. Though so they're going to be looking elsewhere, and it's going to be like a rebuild for them, I think, at least on the offensive side of the ball, right? They have a lot of picks in the draft this year. They have two first-round picks, two second-round picks, a third, fourth, two fifth-round picks. So they're definitely going to be looking for at least one quarterback, maybe two at some point. There's a good chance Shady is running behind a rookie quarterback next year in 2018. I mean, it's not a death blow. I have him at pick number 10, so it's not like I'm putting him in the third round. But uh, I like a lot of the other running backs that I mentioned more than Shady. That's why I have him at 10. There's just a few question marks there in Buffalo. Now, I know there's some other guys that I love still. It's Kareem Hunt. There's A.J. Green. There's the Michael Thomases of the world. Julio Joneses and stuff. Those are like honorable mentions. I'm not going to get into them now. I'm just going to do the top 10 picks of the draft. So that is going to wrap up this video. If you enjoyed, do me a huge favor, please. Just scroll down and give the video a thumbs up. That helps me get more traction to the video. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We'll be coming out with fantasy football videos all offseason into the season, up to your draft, throughout the season, playoffs, whatever. Uh, as well as I do my vlog every Saturday in case you're new to the channel. Thumbs it up. Leave a comment down below if you're taking Gurley over Bell. I want to know why. If you want to enter the giveaway again, it's going to be a mini championship belt. It's going to be one of my hats. Go follow me on IG. And thank you all for joining me. Next video will be five crazy stats slash five things I learned from the 2017 fantasy football season. As always, I love you all. Thank you all for tuning in. If you stayed this far, I appreciate the shit out of you. I appreciate you giving me your time. And that's all. Go thumbs up, baby.